Hi, and welcome back to the First Christian Church of Lawton. Welcome home. I'm glad you were able to join us today as we continue our August worship series, Games God Plays. We've already looked at the ways in which God has gone to great pains to create a universe that is truly, deeply, on the subatomic level, unpredictable and free. We've wondered about what that might mean for God, our Creator, who would fashion a world in such a way. And we've also taken a look at the work of Christ in the Gospel according to Matthew, as he strode across the sea, demonstrating a mastery over the elements of nature. In our last week's service, God breaks the physics engine. This week, we'll be taking a look again at games God plays, though our look this week will be a little bit different because today we will be concentrating on one particular story wherein God gets outflanked. That's right, somebody managed to play the game better than the creator of the thing himself. And so today, during our worship service, we are going to challenge some conventional notions about what it means to be perfect, what it means to emulate Christ, and what it means that Jesus himself was course-corrected as he thought about his mission in the world. So I invite you to join us today for this time of discovery and exploration as we visit a somewhat familiar story from the Gospels in an entirely new light. Would you please pray with me? God of surprises, we open ourselves up to being surprised today. We admit that so often in our world we think that being wrong or admitting we don't know something is somehow a failing on our part. Help us to be open to new information. Help us to be open to having our prejudices and preconceived notions and ideas exposed. Help us, through the mirror that others hold up to our faces, to see ourselves, our actions, and our motivations more clearly. And may we have the humility, the integrity, and the intelligence to course correct when we are wrong. All these things we ask and pray through your Son, Christ Jesus' name, who himself gave us an example of how to act in times such as those. Amen. I now invite you to join with me as together we worship the Lord in song. This is a day of new beginnings, time to remember and move on, time to believe what love is bringing, laying to rest the pain that's gone, for by the life and death of Jesus, God's mighty spirit now has then. Make for us a world of difference as faith and hope are born again. Then let us, with the Spirit's daring, step from the past and leave behind our disappointment, guilt, and grieving, seeking. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come before you today, acknowledging our own limitations and faults. So often when we see other people, we fail to see your image in them. We fail to embrace them as brothers and sisters, as your children who are beloved. Oftentimes this failing comes as a result of our own personal prejudices, of those things we've heard of others growing up, 
the climate that we find ourselves in politically. So often when we find others whose ideology disagrees with ours, who look significantly different than we do, or who hold different viewpoints than we hold, we fail to see your image in them. And this failure can lead us to dehumanize and degrade others. Help us this morning to take stock of those times in which we have failed to see your image in your creation. May our own prejudices be exposed to us and held up in the mirror that is our experience of others and you. May we have the courage to be truly honest with ourselves about times in which we have gone astray, about times in which we have been wrong, and help us to course correct. Help us to learn from the examples of others, particularly those who are different than ourselves. For it is when we are able to embrace that which is difficult to love in the other, that we come to embrace our own humanity more fully. I say this, Lord, this morning not to pardon sin when we see it. Systemic sin and racism is a deep and profound evil. But help us when we see it in ourselves to turn in repentance. When we see it in others, may we speak the truth in love. Help us, Lord, to bear witness to your kingdom which is a place that is made up of all tribes and tongues, all people and languages, all groups, Lord, all who are made in your image. And may we love them as you have loved us. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. From there, Jesus went to the regions of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from those territories came out and shouted, Show me mercy, son of David. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But he didn't respond to her at all. The disciples came and urged him, Send her away. She keeps shouting after us. Jesus replied, I've only been sent to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He replied, it's not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off their master's table. Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. It will be just as you wish. And right then, her daughter was healed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us and bring us to believe. We are ourselves accepted and meant to love and live. Teach us, O oh Lord, your lessons as in our daily life. We struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to care for people, for all, not just for some. To love them as we find them, or as they may become. Let your acceptance change us so that we may be moved in living sin.
situations to do the truth in love to practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's healing heart lord for today's encounters with all who and bread. We need new eyes for seeing, new hands for holding on. Renew us with your spirit, Lord, free us, make us one. We have this idea in our heads that we have to have it all together at all times. We have this idea that we need to be right whenever we talk to someone, whether it's about politics, automotive repair, religion, or relationships. We have this notion that there is some kind of crime in admitting there is a limit to our knowledge. I'll tell you, when I was in school, I remember teachers that would be asked questions and they would always try to pontificate or redirect or change the subject back to an area that they understood without really answering the question being asked. They probably thought they were doing a great service to the class or at very least thought that they were wonderful teachers for being able to redirect, to change the class's flow and function. But my favorite teachers in school were the ones who would look at a student when posing a question they didn't quite get. They would say to them, you know, I don't know, but let me look into it. And then actually followed up afterward, of course. These were the teachers who understood that no human being can know absolutely everything, that even if you're a subject matter expert in a particular area, you still need to have an educable mind and spirit if you want to grow and develop and just be honest as a human being. That's why I absolutely love the story of the encounter with the Canaanite woman in the Gospel according to Matthew. You see, Jesus had notions about what his mission was in the world. Jesus thought that he had been sent exclusively to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel up to this point in Matthew's Gospel. And so, working off of this mission and this idea, Jesus goes out and preaches and heals and delivers and feeds multitudes. Then he encounters a problematic woman who simply won't let her issue drop. And why should she? The woman we read about in this story, the Canaanite woman, she is a Gentile first. Second, she is also in possession of a demon-possessed daughter. When we're facing circumstances, when our loved ones are suffering or going through something we ourselves can't explain or understand, is there anything we wouldn't do to try to reach out and find help for them? In this case, that reaching out and finding help meant going to a Jewish healer whom she had heard about. And upon coming to this healer, this figure and begging him for mercy, she's met with stone silence. Jesus, who just got done explaining to his disciples that it's what comes out of a person, not what goes into them that defiles them, refuses to acknowledge the presence of hurt and suffering in his midst because he is under the impression that this woman is outside the purview of the people of God to whom he is called to serve. Friends, I really can't put too fine a point on that. Jesus understood his mission as a mission exclusively in Matthew's Gospel up to this point, as a mission to the house of Israel. But this encounter, this encounter changes everything. And it's upon this encounter that the Gospel itself pivots. Here Jesus encounters a woman who he firmly believes to be beneath him in society. Don't believe me? In just a moment after ignoring this woman's request, the first time in the Gospels he ignores someone's request. 
He calls her a dog. Let's not sugarcoat this. Jesus is fully divine, but he's also fully human. And part of what it means to be human it means that we come into a world where we're taught certain things. Certain prejudices of prior generations are spoon-fed to us just as surely as mushed peas or paplum. It's in the air we breathe. It's in the world around us. The wrong ideas, the prejudices and preconceived notions of prior generations are poured into us and we as children are vessels that take it in. Some of us reject, some of us accept, but more often than not, we just don't analyze these ideas. We take them in. I believe this way because my parents believe this way, because their parents believe this way, because their parents believe this way. I hold to this ideology because everyone that I know holds to it. And folks, that everyone that I know holds to it thing just gets worse as time progresses, not better. As we look around, we come into a place where we curate our own worlds, where dissenting voices are silenced as quickly as we can unfriend someone on Facebook. We are in a world where we can make sure that we consume only media, only movies, only art, only conversations that already agree with our own preconceived notions and ideas. Can you imagine if Jesus did that for a moment? Can you imagine if Jesus played the game he played on the easiest setting possible, ensuring that he would encounter no resistance, ensuring that he would encounter no one outside the purview of his preconceived notions of how the world worked? Absolute best case scenario, the message of the Christian faith would be another sect within Judaism and wouldn't have grown at all beyond that. We would still be ignorant of God's word of salvation in the larger world. All of the effects of Christianity throughout the millennia, and there have been some bad along with some good, but let's run off a tick list of the good ones for a moment. The university education system, orphanages, hospitals, libraries as they currently exist, none of these would be a thing. If Jesus had decided to curate his own community and exclude anyone whose opinions or ideology differed from his own, can you imagine where we would be? But we're told, even in the multiple lists of his disciples, as we read throughout the Gospels, we'll find zealots and tax collectors. We'll find people who will deny and people who will betray. Jesus surrounded himself with all kinds of folks who were all kinds of different from himself to a point. They were all still male. They all still belonged to the house of Israel, at least the named disciples here. Not to say there weren't women who were followers of Jesus. In fact, it was the women who were the only ones who remained faithful to him as he hung on the cross, abandoned by his friends. They and that disciple who Jesus loved in John's gospel. But I'm getting off the point a little bit. Jesus thought his mission of salvation worked in a particular way, and here, a tenacious clever woman, a foreigner who refuses to repay insult for insult, but instead deftly turns the words and the logic of Jesus himself on their head, presses him to the point where he has no choice but to recognize her faith and the image of God inherent in her. And he does exactly what she asks. Not only does he do exactly what she asks, Jesus is Entire mission takes a wild turn right after this. Because after a healing of several people there at the mountain by the Galilee Sea, we have something fascinating happen. Jesus begins once again to feed the multitudes. For those of you who think, boy, the disciples really are slow to figure stuff out, in Matthew's Gospel this is especially true because Matthew likes to tell stories multiple times. But he doesn't just do this for the sake of doing it. In fact, he doesn't even do it as some have hypothesized because the Torah tells us in the mouth of two witnesses the law is established. Instead, when these stories are reduplicated, usually there are crucial changes in the details that make them take on a different meaning. Now, Jesus fed the 5,000 in chapter 14, shortly before this story takes place. But here, in chapter 15, Jesus performs yet another miraculous feeding. 
Now Jesus called his disciples and said, I feel sorry for the crowd because they have been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry for fear they won't have enough strength to travel. His disciples replied, where are we going to get enough food in this wilderness to satisfy such a big crowd? If you're following Matthew's chronology, Jesus fed the 5,000 just a few days before this conversation. Jesus responded, how much bread do you have? They responded, seven loaves and a few fish. These could have been leftovers from the earlier meal. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. He took the seven loaves of bread and the fish, and after he gave thanks, he broke them into pieces and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate until they were full. The disciples collected seven baskets full of leftovers. 4,000 men ate, plus women and children. After dismissing the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. Folks, the reason for the inclusion of this story of the feeding of the 4,000, the symbolism in it, its numeric symbolism in the four groups of three tens in the seven lobes that were great about, it's, it's a message, both in terms of the geography as to where it happens and its numerical symbolic content. This message that's contained in the story, this reduplication of an earlier feeding story, the message is all the nations from the four corners of the earth are now included in the scope of the salvific work of God in the world. Jesus didn't just change his mind because of his encounter with this woman from Canaan. Jesus changed the game. His idea of what he was called to do was expanded and the work of God in the world grew and blossomed. So I ask you this, in our own day and age, how often are we confronted with ideas that don't exactly line up with our understanding of the world? How often are we pushed to think, maybe, maybe the world's bigger. Maybe I've been blind to prejudices and ideologies that I grew up with that were in the air and in the water. How often in our world are we presented with the opportunity to see that questions are being asked we may not have the answers to, that we run across the limits of our own understanding, that we sit in that uncomfortable place of cognitive dissonance where new information is being presented to us in a way that is hard for us to understand, in a way that causes us to have to let go of ideas that we once held on to to embrace new frames of understanding the world. Folks, this is how growth takes place. And if we continue to carefully curate our communities in person and online, we will miss out on opportunities for growth, for expansion, to see that there are many different ways of seeing and understanding the world. Because if we don't enlarge our own, our mission, our work, our witness to the kingdom of God in the world is funneled and muted down to simply shades of gray instead of all of the beautiful color that our creative God has put out into this fantastic world in which we live. Let's emulate Christ. If Christ is perfect and perfection allowed itself to be corrected, let's do the same. Let's find that maybe God's calling to us, maybe God's world, maybe those who are included in God's work are bigger and more vast than we could possibly imagine. Maybe there are still prejudices in our world that need to be rooted out. Maybe we still have our blind spots. Maybe we need to embrace the discomfort and walk with others if we are to ultimately win what we are called to win in this game of life. Amen. During Christ's last night on this earth, he invited his disciples to share a meal with him. There, gathered around the table, were tax collectors and scholars, were zealots and fishermen, were liars, deniers, and betrayers. There, gathered around that table, were some who would believe and some who would doubt. Because how could it be Christ's table unless all of those people were there? This is the amazing thing about the game that God is playing. God wants everyone to be involved. Even those staunch 
conservative white-collar workers and those hippy-dippy weirdo freaks. God wants our brothers and sisters and those who identify as neither brother nor sister of all races and languages, creeds and colors to come and participate and be a part of God's life and work in the world. That's the beauty of the symbol of Christ's table where bread is broken and a cup is poured out and nourishment and invitation and room and welcome and hospitality are shown to all, even to you, even to me. For what I received from the Lord I have also delivered unto you, that on the night in which he was betrayed our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so for the remembrance of me. Therefore, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these gifts of bread and cup that you have given to us. May your spirit rest now upon them. May they be transformed in our lives from mere sustenance to the spiritual food that we need in order to draw power for living. May they become to us in a very special way the presence of your body and blood. As we take them into ourselves, let us acknowledge the divine not only in ourselves, but in all others who share this meal with us. It is in the name of your Son we pray. Amen. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. This is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Lord, we do not presume to come to this, your table, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, yet you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Friends, that's about all the time we have here today. Thank you for joining us once again here in this place. Thank you for coming to play with us in this creative world that God has made. My prayer for you as you go out into this world is that you find new playmates, find folks to engage with. Let your world be enlarged and expanded by those spaces that you meet. And no matter how different they may be than you, no matter how different their ideology may be than yours, let you find a way to see the image of God at work in them. Game on.